So now we're going to turn to Mr. Ken Frazier, who's going to be joining us by video to discuss Merck's commitment to um, Merck's commitment to diversity and inclusion. Mr. Frazier, Ken Frazier, has served as the chairman of the board and chief executive officer of Merck since 2011. Ken joined Merck in 1992, held positions of increasing responsibility, including general counsel and president. Prior to joining Merck, Ken was a partner with the Philadelphia law firm of Drinker, Biddle, and Reith. Ken's contributions, especially in the legal, business, and humanitarian fields have been widely recognized. He sits on the boards of Pharma, Wild Cornell Medicine, and Cornerstone Christian Academy in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Additionally, Ken is co-chair of the Legal Services Corporation's Leaders Council. He is also a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, the Business Council, and the, the Council of the American Law Institute and the American Bar Association. To react to Mr. Frazier's remarks, we will be joined by LaVarne Burton, President and CEO of the American Kidney Fund, as well as Kenny Mendes, President and CEO of the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. Good morning. I'm delighted delighted to address all of you today at the start of the National Health Council's 2020 Science of Patient Engagement Symposium. Many thanks to Mark Booten, Eleanor Perfetto, and the National Health Council team for their efforts to convene such an impressive roster of participants for this meeting. First, thank you, Mark, for your more than 17 years of service and leadership at the helm of the NHC. Thank you for helping to place the voice of the patient at the center and for your relentless dedication to making our healthcare system work better for the patients we all serve. At Merck, we recognize that we have a responsibility to address the needs of an increasingly diverse set of patients, customers, employees, and partners. And since clinical trials function as the gatekeeper to bringing effective new medicines and vaccines safely to all our patients and communities, nowhere is it more important that we have diverse representation than in our research efforts. A critical part of research is the input from and collaboration with diverse groups of patients like those represented by all of you to better understand their points of view, alleviate their existing burdens, and ultimately accelerate research. It is essential that we incorporate patient input in every step of the journey. Our nation is currently enmeshed in the confluence of three major catastrophes. While coping with the COVID-19 pandemic, that disproportionately and negatively impacts communities of color, particularly the black community, we are also affected by the resulting economic downturn and horrified by continued examples of racial injustice and its aftermath. As I see it, it is time to move beyond platitudes and commit to actions that create true progress towards social justice and health equity. Cancer is a powerful example of how these inequities converge to have a devastating impact on patients, families, and communities. Cancer incidence is also disproportionately higher in underrepresented minorities and access to timely diagnosis and quality care, including clinical trials, is suboptimal. The disparities in the COVID-19 pandemic are also exacerbated by higher rates of chronic disease among many minority populations, inequitable access to healthcare, and systemic bias within the healthcare system. To address these inequities, we must recruit and engage clinical trial participants 
who are racially, socioeconomically, and demographically representative of the diverse population we aim to serve. At Merck, we're pursuing new ways to recruit and engage a diverse population of clinical trial participants, and our efforts include working with the NIH and the active, harmonized platform to expand recruitment of underrepresented groups into multiple COVID-19 trials. Implementation of DNI strategies within our ongoing prostate cancer and HIV clinical studies. Use of dynamic patient enrollment tools. Support of the National Medical Fellowships Clinical Research University, which trains minority physicians to be principal investigators in clinical trials. And our work with patient advisory panels, scientific experts, and others to gain insights about what matters most to patients. Disparities in access to medical research and the benefits of promising innovations are manifestations of a much larger societal problem. Until we improve economic inclusion among people of color, the most important root cause of most of the disparities in our society, we will struggle to fully address its consequences. At Merck, we have a long-standing commitment to improving economic inclusion focused on four specific areas. First, we will continue to broaden our partnerships with minority-owned businesses which in 2019 included procurements of more than $1.3 billion and over the past three years have helped support the employment of more than 37,000 people of color. Second, we're investing in community programs that directly affect health disparities. For example, through Merck for Mothers, we announced a new funding round for the U.S. Safer Cities Initiative to address health disparities in maternal mortality. Likewise, we have committed $30 million over two years to help address the impact of COVID-19, including contributions to urban organizations that are working to address the health disparities and stigma imposed by the pandemic among communities of color. Third, we are expanding our programs to support access to better jobs and job training among communities of color. And fourth, we're taking stock of our own internal performance to identify areas where we can improve in hiring and promoting people from underrepresented groups. As I close my remarks, I am pleased to say that since the Prescription Drug User Fee Act 5 was enacted nearly 10 years ago, we have seen the role of patients in the drug development process evolve significantly. As a result of the tireless efforts of individual patients, advocacy groups, companies, researchers, government, and others, we have advanced our objective of ensuring that patient input and collaboration is embedded in our day-to-day -day activities and considered business as usual. And organizations like the NHC played an integral role in laying the foundation for this success by driving home the importance of the patient's role in drug development and in collaborations with companies and the FDA. This can only be accomplished by partnering more closely with patients from the start. So my question to all of us as leaders in this space is this. How do we build upon the great strides we have made since the Prescription Drug User Fee Act 5? And what will it take to make an even bigger impact in the next decade? These are the questions we need to be asking diverse patients, providers, and partners so we can continue to improve upon the gains and meet more of the needs of all of the patients we serve. Thank you again for the opportunity to be a part of this forum. I wish you all an engaging and insightful event. Laverne, Kenny, you all are up. Thank you so much, Eduardo. And I especially want to thank Ken 
for his thoughtful commentary and insight on what's going on in, at Merck. I also want very much to thank Dewan. I think that Ken has given us Merck's plan for addressing these issues, but Dewan has really given us a call to action of why we are talking about this today and why it's so important. As an African-American woman, I have to say first that regardless of where you are socioeconomically, where you live, if you're a black person in this country, you are so affected and so concerned that your husband, son, and now even daughter might be at risk because of a misunderstanding. And I think the challenge for all of us is to figure out in our own space, how do we come to address these issues and how do we put our country back on the track that I believe we all want. For all of us who are here, whether you are representing pharma, a supplier, uh, a trade association, a charitable organization, we're here because we are here to serve patients, patients who have medical needs. And that is the commonality that brings us all together that is central to everything that we do. Ken made a point about the higher incidence of cancer among people of color. We could probably substitute almost any disease and the conclusion would be the same, that there are serious issues with regard to access serious issues with regard to quality of care, and that those lead to outcomes which are disproportionately adverse for people of color. And complicating all of that, layering on all of that, is now the incidence of COVID. I represent a community, kidney patients, that among Medicare patients, the rate of hospitalization from COVID has been the highest of any group, eight times that of other patients. And so we at the American Kidney Fund are particularly concerned about all of the issues that are on the table today. Ken also made the point that it is time for us to move from platitude to action. And I think all of us have to take a look in the mirror and realize that no matter what we've done in the past, that we can do it better. That the outcomes demand that we relook everything that we do and figure out how can we make that next step? Um, how can we do it better? At the American Kidney Fund, in conjunction with our staff going back to May, we have been engaged in conversations and we've developed a 10-point plan of how we're going to address these issues. And that plan will certainly evolve over time because we certainly don't start off knowing the answers. But we're looking at everything from our programs and how they interact with the patients that are at the heart of our mission, to our own hiring practices, as well as to those of our vendors. One example is that we recently renegotiated and held an RFP for our financial advisor. As part of that conversation, we and our committee, our finance committee, asked that vendor about their hiring practices and their representation of people of color among their staff. And we are also requiring that in terms of the team that works with the American Kidney Fund, that we want people of color on that team and that we will continue to work with that vendor throughout the contract to see what progress is being made. And we certainly are holding ourselves to the same standard in terms of our own hiring practices within the American Kidney Fund. Ken also talked about clinical trials and that certainly resonates with us. Um, we, have, we have on our website and are working with patients to increase understanding about clinical trials, to provide information to them, not only on what clinical trials are available in which they might want to participate, but to also just give general information uh, to help them evaluate whether or not they want to participate. We have an advocacy network that includes about 15,000 patients and supporters. Our first goal in that advocacy network is really to establish a relationship, to establish trust. And once we've done that, then we can begin to talk about the patient involvement um, in our policy issues and advocating, as well as in clinical issues, including clinical trials. We wanna get better representation, all of us do, with regard to uh, clinical trials. 
And we know that in order to do increase that participation, um, we've got to have a two-way conversation with patients. We've got to make sure that not only are we calling on patients to join us, but that we are listening to them and that we understand their perspective. That it's very important for patients to be involved throughout the clinical trial process, including on the, um, in the clinical um, research design phase. We have a, um, a digital resource hub on our website. We also engage with our patients on social media uh, about the information that's there and to give them additional resources that they can use in terms of better understanding this process, uh, better become developing relationships um, with those who are doing the trials and hopefully increasing that participation. We also think that it's very important to note that there is considerable misunderstanding uh, of patients, not only around clinical trials, but also with regard to the professionals uh, who provide care. A few years ago, we conducted a survey of patient uh, adherence. We included 12,000 dialysis patients and about 400 uh, renal professionals. And we found that there was a great divergence, a huge gap between patients and their professionals, their medical professionals working with them about the reasons for lack of adherence. That is one thing that I believe that we all have to address, not only around clinical trials, but around care as well. Uh, we're doing that uh, at the American Kidney Fund, and we hope that other groups are also doing the same thing because it is all part of establishing that trust and providing a resource to patients. We understand that medical professionals cannot do it all and that there is a role there for charitable organizations to step in around patient education, around patient support, and around providing information again with regard to trials and other resources that may be available to patients. And that in doing so, particularly focusing on uh, patients of color, that we begin to close some of these considerable gaps and begin to find ways of even better improving the health outcomes uh, for the patients that we serve. Thank you very much for, uh, for listening to these comments and I look forward to the rest of the discussion. I'll turn it back to you, Eduardo. Kenny, it's now your turn. Sure, thank, thank you, uh, Eduardo. And thank you, Laverne and Dewan as well. I mean, this is a heavy lift and um, I appreciate Ken's leadership in this space and the many concrete initiatives being pursued by Merck to make a difference in health disparities. I'm gonna take a bigger picture view because and echo a lot of what Laverne has said. Um, we, the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, AFA, just released our, our disparities report. And while Ken mentioned cancer, the focus in our report is asthma. And as Laverne mentioned, I'm sure that there are close, if not identical similarities between elements of the asthma community, the cancer community, uh, or any other condition when it comes to health disparities. Our report we first did in 2005, so this was a 15 year uh, uh, revision of a report we first did, and it revealed that while we've made tremendous advances in asthma therapies, if you think about the technology, the Affordable Care Act, and other things, um, the outcomes for the Black, Hispanic, Indigenous American, and Alaska Native communities have not benefited as much. So when we looked at 2005 versus 2015, or 2005 versus 2020 now, 15 years later, just give you some statistics. Black, Puerto Rican, and Indigenous Americans have the highest rates of asthma. Puerto Ricans specifically have the highest rates of asthma compared to any other racial or ethnic group in the United States. Black Americans are three times more likely to die from asthma than white Americans. Black patients are five times more likely to be treated in the hospital emergency room compared to white patients. Black women die from asthma at a higher rate than any other group when race uh, and, and gender are factored in. Those statistics have not changed since 2005. So we clearly need to be doing more here. And not only is there a heartbreaking human cost, one thing that I, I don't think we've mentioned here, uh, these disparities come at a staggering financial cost to Americans. 
Um, the overall price tag for healthcare disparities is about $135 billion per year due to excess medical expense and lost uh, wages and untapped productivity. So there's a financial argument here. So again, when we think back to, to what Ken said, what Laverne said, Ken's leadership at Merck, um, what I loved about it was he, he wants to stop, stop talking about it and actually do something about it which is what the roadmap in our disparities report really defines. And we know that we can't do it alone. We've really got a partner, which is I think why all of us are here at this conference. Uh, Ken's remarks, the NHC really provide fertile ground for us to make a difference in disparities now. So I'll pause there. Thank you.